Hello friends. I sure hope that you're doing well. Thank you for joining me again this week. We are on chapter four of James and then we'll only have one chapter left. So let's uh, just dig in and get started. Last week we did talk a little bit in chapter three um, about the Bereans. Um, that's not mentioned in James, that's actually mentioned in Acts, but we talked about it last week during the James chapter 3 study. And we mentioned that the Bereans searched the scriptures to see uh, what St. Paul said was true and how that really relates to us and how we need to be very diligent in searching the scriptures ourselves to uh, ascertain and discern if what we're uh, being taught by others is true. So that that uh, pertains to what you're hearing here as well. Uh, but here's a question for you. Um, what scriptures were the Bereans searching? Have you ever thought about that? You know, we, we take it for granted. We just think, well, the, the scriptures, the ones we have in front of us. But at the time that the Bereans were searching the scriptures, they only had uh, what we call the Old Testament, or uh, I prefer to refer uh, to them as the Hebrew scriptures. They, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So they were searching the Hebrew scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. And Paul was talking to them about who the Messiah is and that the Messiah is Jesus. And so it's important for us to think of the Bible really as one book, not as two separate, two separate Old and New, New Testaments or Old and New Covenants, but as one unified book. And that the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, point to who the Messiah is. They point to Jesus and that Jesus fulfilled, oh, I, well over 300 prophetic things uh, that are written in the Hebrew scriptures. So uh, they point to Jesus. It's not just, not just the New Testament. All right, but let, let's dig into uh, James chapter 4 now. And really what James chapter 4 is talking about the most, I think, is how to draw close to God. What are some of the things um, that keep us away from God? And what are some of the things that draw us close to God? So first of all, let's recognize that friendship with the world puts us at enmity with God, James says. Our sin nature has evil motives. And we need our heart and our mind to be transformed. And that comes as we submit to the Spirit of God and to the Word of God. The Word of God actually renews our mind. It cleanses it. It reprograms it. Um, I sort of think of it as it brainwashes me, but in a good way. The world system is actually brain trash. And that needs to be cleaned out of our minds. So we need our minds to be washed, brainwashed, renewed by the word of God. Romans 12, 2 in the NLT tells us, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, we'll, then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So again, the word of God washes us and that's really why it's important to be good good students, good readers uh, of the word of God. Secondly, we are to humble ourselves. We need to recognize that God's ways and his thoughts are not like ours. They're much higher than ours, Isaiah tells us in chapter 55 verses eight through nine. And then when we do those things, then we resist the devil. We resist his tactics. We resist his ways of uh, coming against us, trying to have us be, you know, double-minded, wondering, is this God? Isn't this God? Those kind of things. So our loyalty is not to be divided between God and the world. We, we do have to set our minds on the Lord and on the Word of God. 
We cannot be a people that are straddling the fence. Uh, James even says, I think at the beginning, you know, a double-minded person is not going to receive anything from God. I think that was in chapter one. Anyway, so we can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. Um, sort of like, you know, an example of that could be, well, I go to church on Sunday. I read the Bible once in a while. I pray once in a while. But the rest of the week, I kind of do what I want to do. No, it doesn't work well that way. Trust me, it really doesn't. Because then we are double-minded. Our whole lives are to be devoted to God. If we would fulfill the commandment that Jesus gave us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. One area where believers should not be like the world is in the area of anxiety. Now, this is a common a thing that many people go through. It's, a, it's absolutely in a re reality. And I think especially in this season that we've been in the last six months with COVID, anxiety has increased quite a bit. But Jesus talks to us about anxiety. And in Matthew chapter 6, he actually tells us six times not to be anxious or in some uh, versions, it uses the word worry. So we're going to look at that together. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's read from the um, English Standard Version, the ESV, and read from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. If you have your Bible, uh, you can grab it and read along or just uh, listen to me while I read. Uh, now the heading here, which of course that's you know, wasn't written by people who wrote the Bible, but the heading here is do not be anxious. So beginning in verse 25 of Matthew chapter six, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now that's really countercultural, isn't it? Isn't it? Because the world tells us we need to be thinking about that kind of stuff all the time especially we need to be thinking about what are we going to be doing in retirement but anyway back to what the scriptures say jesus says to us is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not more more value than they and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now that is a rather different perspective than what the world would teach us, isn't it? So sometimes we just have to remember what Jesus said and then practice it. Now the word anxious and worry mean to be divided, to be distracted, concerned, and it can even mean to feel strangled. Now if you've ever had an anxiety attack, I think you can attest to that. You feel like you're being strangled. This is not what the Lord wants for us. So let us trust him. Let us trust the Lord and not our own devices. 
And one way we can do this is through prayer and through thankfulness or by even meditating on these scriptures and believing what God has said. Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And then the peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then verse 8 says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellency, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And then Paul says to practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So we submit to God by refusing anxiety, praying with thanksgiving, and thinking about good things. That it is an exercise. It's something we must practice doing. And as we practice it, we will get better at it. Um, we also cleanse ourselves by confessing and repenting of sin. James 4.11 says that we are not to speak evil against one another. And remember, we talked about that back in chapter 3 last week, didn't we? Also, another way that we submit to God is we're not to judge. Now, James is talking here in the sense of not condemning others because that is God's prerogative. I suggest reading those verses in the New Living Translation also. That may add a little light uh, to it. Think of an earthly judge. An earthly judge passes sentence on the guilty. We are not to pass a sentence on someone as an earthly judge would do. The subject of judging is somewhat of a hot topic within Christian circles, isn't it? Today in Christian culture, many people say, well, don't judge me. You shouldn't be judging me. Quoting Jesus when he said, don't judge because with whatever measure you judge, you will be judged. That's in Matthew 7, verse 2. And this is a truth. But again, we're talking here about condemning or passing a sentence on someone. We're not talking about whether saying something is sin or not. God clearly tells us in his word what sin is. If someone is lying or stealing or committing adultery or sleeping together before marriage or gossiping or doing things that the Bible says are sinful, it is not a judgment to call it that. That's just stating a fact. God is the one, though, who passages judgment as in what the consequences to the behavior will be. There is always forgiveness of sin when it is confessed and repented, but repented of, but that doesn't mean that there are no consequences. Galatians 6, 7 says, whatever one sows, that will he also reap. It is God's grace that restores us to relationship with him and his mercy to not give us what our actions deserve. May we not take his grace and his mercy for granted. And may we always also extend it to others. We are to restore one another and bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 1 tells us. Now, there are times, however, when judgment is pronounced, and Paul did this himself. He even said, I pronounce judgment. An example of that is uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when someone was actually disenfranchised from fellowship or, or put out of the church. Now, this was an extreme case, and it was dealt with 
by Paul, who was an apostle. So these things are to be dealt with within a church community by the leadership, by the elders, um, and by people that would be around someone. And normally this type of severe judgment would only be done after there had been many attempts at loving restoration. Now, Paul is also saying that we are judging someone inside of the church, not someone in the world, okay? So there are differences between what's happening within a church community and uh, how we interact with people who are non-believers. Now, we can be fruit inspectors, as my husband likes to say, but we are to be fruit inspectors of um, people within uh, who are believers, who have confessed to be believers. And we're really only to do that after we have dealt with our own issues as well. But Jesus clearly told us in Matthew chapter 7 that, you know, don't try to take the speck out of your brother's eye uh, when you've got a great big beam sitting in your in your own but we are to look at fruit in people's lives good fruit in a person's life means that the tree is good a good tree bears good fruit a bad tree bears bad fruit also in matthew chapter 7 i think that's a good chapter for us to read uh, this week as well most of all uh, most of all we have to really examine our own fruit maybe our own tree needs a little cultivating and pruning first because normally when we point the finger at someone there's actually three fingers here pointing back at ourselves so we must be careful in these in these areas and this is why we really need the help of the holy spirit isn't it these guidelines that we're talking about here um, in the word of god are to help us but we must remember that each situation is unique and we must take each before the Lord in prayer, seeking his wisdom. Finally, James warns us about being self-confident. That is making our own plans and decisions without consulting the Lord and also knowing that plans may change. God is in charge of our lives. And if he moves us in a different direction than we thought our life should go, then that is his prerogative. He's the potter and we are the clay. If anything, these months of COVID are teaching us that, I think. So these are ways that we draw near to God and thereby we resist the devil and he flees from us. James chapter 4, verse 7. All right, I think that's it for this week. We've got one more chapter to go. But in the meantime, I do want to invite you to our Fall Women of the Word Conference, October 2nd and 3rd in East Longmeadow, Massachusetts. We are having an in-person event, but with limited seating, so you need to register soon. And then it will also be a live-streamed pay-per-view. So check our website, godconferences.com, for the information and I hope that you'll be able to join us for this special time Friday evening October the 2nd and Saturday October the 3rd. The Lord bless you this week and we'll see each other again soon. Bye-bye.